doesn't come easy on the water. Racing over the waves at 120 miles per hour takes more thrust than 200 on land. Water packs a resistance far greater than that of air. The secret? Get the boat up, up out of the water so it can fly over the top, but not too far up because even the best boats make very poor airplanes. Hidden away deep in Florida alligator territory is a test facility so secret it's not even shown on the maps. A place known only as Lake X. Here, the fastest boat racers in the world come to experiment, to test their latest equipment and most promising new ideas. For the secrets of speed on water are carefully guarded information. In this program, we're going to take you behind the scenes to discover those inside secrets. And to do that, we've turned first to one of the fastest men in the business, Reggie Fountain. Not since the legendary Don Arana, Father had one man so successfully designed, built, and raced his own boats. A former world champion tunnel boat racer, Reggie Fountain is now chairman of a multi-million dollar company that produces a new generation of speedboats that are among the fastest in the world. Reggie is a hands-on CEO. His office, every chance he gets, the cockpit of his 120 mile per hour race boat, hands on the throttle. This past season, he scored victories in both American Powerboat Association and offshore professional tour competition. Reggie's secret of speed begins with a simple idea. Well, the more you get the boat up out of the water and into the air, the faster the boat will generally run. Water hydrodynamically poses much greater resistance for high speed than does the air. So the more the boat is piercing the air as opposed to the water, the faster the boat's going to be. The downside of that uh, is that it takes a lot of horsepower and a lot of money to get you up there. In some cases, uh, if you're up on the top of the water, depending on how rough the water is, the boat might tend to be quite a bit rougher than if you're knifing through the water. The first key breakthrough in getting a boat to knife through the water was the development of the deep V hull. Deep V is uh, exactly what it says. You're, you're shaped much like a V and you knife through the water and smooth out the waves is the idea there. That has a drawback to the extent that the deeper you pierce the water, the slower the boat's going to run. So what we tried to do with uh, the boats that, that we build is to design a modified type of V-bottom boat that gives the advantages of knifing through the top of the water rather than deep down in the water. So it lifts you above the water, but it's still nice through the water. The next major breakthrough in the search for speed on water, the invention of the stern drive. The stern drive, which is an offshoot of the output motor hooked up to a uh, automobile V8 engine from within the boat, is probably one of the most innovative uh, developments in high performance boating or any boating for that matter because the stern drive uh, allows you to trim the boat just like an outboard does and a boat that is trimmable as opposed to a boat with a shaft that comes through the bottom of the boat is by a test that we done gives 30 to 60 percent more performance with the uh, same horsepower because you can trim the boat at different angles for different speeds and for different water conditions. For example, you trim much more differently for calm water than you would for rough water. Now, let's take a little ride with Reggie in one of his Merc Cruiser powered high performance boats and watch his secrets. The first step, get the boat up on plane. So as we move forward, the boat will lift up and over. And when you feel it pop up on top of the water, then you're on a plane. That means it's broken free of the water and it's running on top of the water rather than plowing a deep hole through the water, much like a submarine would do. When we initially take off, we trim the trim tabs on the back of the boat down. That means we drop them down below the bottom of the boat. 
so that as the water comes running off the bottom of the boat, it hits the trim tabs which are down. So the water comes off the bottom and hits that tab and lifts it up. If the tab is bolted to the back of the boat, which it is, that tends to kick the tail of the boat up and the nose over and gets you up on plane quicker, which is up on top of the water. So you want your tabs down to trim that boat up. And you have your drives up under the boat, pushing towards the bottom of the boat, pushing towards the surface to lay it over again. Once the boat pops on top and planes, then you want to lift the tabs up to allow the nose to come back up out of the water and run over the top of the water. And you're trying to get the boat more in the air at that point once you've popped up on top of the water and gotten on a plane. So then you want to start trimming your drives out and having your tabs come up the faster you go until you run into some rough water, in which case you may want to bring your tabs back down just a little bit and your drives in just a little bit to knife through the top side of the waves. I say the top side of the waves as opposed to deep down in the waves because if you have a good designed boat planning properly, you'll be running up on top of the water rather than plowing down through the water. But just how far above the water can you run and still maintain control? Uh, you're better off having that boat riding right across the top of the waves, maintaining as much light contact with the water as you can. Uh, way up in the air, it's usually way out of control. You don't have any propellers pushing you, and so you're much better to skim across the top of the waves rather than becoming airborne. And if you give the boat too much lift in rough sea conditions, you're apt to take off, which is not a very safe way to run a boat and not a very smooth way or fast way to run a boat. So trim is again very important depending on water conditions as well as speed conditions. The next secret, coaxing the boat into a turn. We drop the tabs down just a little, we bring the drives in a little to tighten the boat back into the water because I said as you drop the tabs and bring the drives in, the boat tends to plow down into the water more and would allow it to track more around the corner. If you are up on top, really running fast, and are making very little contact with the water, as you would be doing in a high-speed planing condition, it's harder to get the boat to track in a corner. So I trim the drives in and the tabs down to give the boat better contact, and it tracks around the, the uh, turns much, much better. Championship Offshore Racing, the ultimate test of speed on water. The top speed of our racing boats, of both our twin engine uh, manufacturer's V-bottom boat, which is uh, basically an open class boat, and our triple engine super boat, uh, both run in the neighborhood of 120 miles an hour. This boat will run from 80 uh, to 100 miles an hour in 3.7 seconds. Flying the waves at that speed requires a fine touch with the throttle, along with lots of horsepower. Power for Fountain's offshore racing boats comes from Merc Cruiser, 1100 horsepower twin turbo V8s, fresh from the shop of renowned engine tuner, Troy Dennis. Without the horsepower that he packs in there and the dependability that he packs into these engines, uh, we'd have a very hard time uh, w maintaining the uh, success that we've gotten into. In our racing boats, we normally have more than one person uh, running the boat. Usually there's someone throttling the boat and possibly trimming the boat, and then there's someone navigating the boat, and that is telling you which way to go. And then there's the driver who's pointing the boat in the direction that the navigator tells him to go. There are an awful lot of functions, and of course you would appoint the navigator and possibly the throttle man uh, to watch all the gauges on the dash, particularly the most important gauges, to make sure that you're not having a problem. We have uh, helmets on, uh, we uh, can talk back and forth freely to each other. How's everything look? Looking good. 100 miles an hour, 5,000. He can't even catch our ass. I'm just running out of way for him. I was 110 for you there. You were hauling ass, son. How are we looking on our temperature? Everybody looking good? We're about 112 or 14. How many off the ass are we turning? But it's got some awesome acceleration, ain't it? Coming up next, the wild world of tunnel boat racing. IOGP tunnel boats, powered by a single high-performance two-liter outboard. They get their name from their unique tunnel-shaped hull, which lifts the boat up out of the water 
allowing it to run on a cushion of air. These are the Formula One machines of boat racing, capable of astounding performance. From a standing start, they reach 100 miles per hour in just five seconds, hitting a top speed of 140. But most amazing is their extraordinary ability to turn. Turn harder than just about any other vehicle in the world. By dropping one side of the tunnel or sponson into the water, they in effect corner as if on rails, producing side forces of over four Gs. The fastest tunnel boat racers explain their secrets. Actually what you're trying to do is, is fly the boat just above the water with, the, with the one tip or one propeller blade in the water for stability. They're kind of like riding on a rocket ship really because they had a lot of acceleration. I mean, uh, you can be going 135, 40 mile an hour in one direction. You can, uh, you can turn around and be going 120 back in the other direction. You pull about four and a half G's in the corner. You're trimming the motor in and out. When you trim the motor out, it gives you more acceleration and lifts the boat up more. When you trim in, it lowers the nose of the boat to set the boat into the turn. When you come to a turn and you settle the boat, the, the water comes all the way up to the driver on the sponsons, and when you start to turn, it's just like carving. And uh, for a lack of better terms, it's just like you're on a railroad track. To fully appreciate the cornering ability of these machines, consider the fact that they pull more G-forces in a turn than does an Indy car. The difference there is that an Indy car, once again, has a track, and they just lose traction at a certain point. And these things, as, as, hard as, the, as long as the boat can stay on the water and curving and hooked up, it'll turn as sharp as you can. Uh, basically, on the steering wheel, we have three buttons, and those are located in uh, very convenient places, and those are what we call the down buttons. And what those do is trim the motor down, which forces the nose of the boat under. On the, on the uh, left foot floor, there's another button that trims the motor out. So in essence, when you're driving one of these boats, you'll find a good attitude that has the boat, what we'll call, flying down the straightaway. Just prior to the corner, you'll trim it under just a little bit to get the boat closer. Right at the turn pin, you'll crack the throttle just to set the boat, turn it. And then at the same time, you'll, you'll stab the throttle wide open and stand on the trim button, which brings the boat back off, which little, literally flies it off the corner. And uh, basically the driver controls the attitude of the engine in and out and up and down so you can get the proper uh, height and feeling. And an experienced driver can tell either by the seat of his pants how the boat's flying because they get a very loose feeling. Or on some cases on the dashboard we'll have a trim indicator which tells the driver the attitude or the angle of the engine. The engines powering these little rocket ships start off as stock outboards. They're Mercury outboard V6s. They're two liter uh, capacity, which is 122.5 cubic inches. Uh, we run electronic fuel injection, and um, basically it, it starts out to be actually a stock 150 horsepower, and we're getting out of that engine now about 320 horsepower. So it's, uh, it's like playing with a hand grenade. They'll turn about 10,000 RPM. The boats themselves, unrigged, weighs about 325 pounds. So the horsepower to weight ratio is quite high. It's, it's, uh, it's amazingly high. We've got a lot of torque out of these engines, so that's, that's the reason we get the acceleration from zero to 100 in less than five seconds out of them. And then when you put all that together in a, in a tunnel boat that weighs uh, you know, 800 pounds and goes 140 miles an hour, you've got the aerodynamics to worry about how you're gonna keep it on the water because uh, everybody goes, you, you trim them up to get them off the water for acceleration, but you have to keep a certain amount of wetted surface and you got to keep that propeller in, in the water a little bit for stability. Yeah, that's basically it, is to get the boat out of the water and just barely be running on the back of the boat and, and fly it almost like an airplane. Like flying an airplane, the secret of control is finesse, not muscle power. You can muscle them, and some drivers are, do muscle them, but, but generally the fastest way around the race course is to let the boat do its own, own deal. You, I mean, the boat obviously can't think for itself, but you've got to help it as much as you can. If you muscle them, it generally slows them down, and they don't like that. They, they generally have characteristics all of themselves. Um, they're a light, fragile boat, and they like to be treated that way when you're driving them. Come into a corner, you trim the boat under a little bit to set it, and then you hit the corner and you trim it out as quick as you can to carry the nose, to lift the nose of the boat up. And you carry it out that high as far as you can just before you blow the boat over. The blow over. 
the tunnel boat racer's worst nightmare. One second, he's trimming the boat up, up, up for more speed. Then too much. He catches air underneath and he's out of control. Now, trimming the engine out is that when you do that, you lift the bow of the boat higher and higher and it gets to a point where the wind will actually get in there and push the boat over backwards. Uh, up to that point though, there's a very fine line and of course you, you gain speed uh, the more you can get away with that. So it's a very fine line how far you can go to how fast you can go. You're running on such a fine edge there that, that uh, you know, you're trying to get every bit of acceleration out of it. You know, you want to win the race and you want to hang the boat up high and a good stiff breeze comes up when you're running down the straightaway and you're you know, it'll pick the boat right up and blow you right over. Or the other instances, if you come down the straightaway too fast and the boats, you're flying it too high and you don't give it a chance to settle, you just turn it. Eventually, when it does settle, you've got the steering wheel already turned and it hooks up. It's just that much more and it just, just literally pushes it around and over. Coming up next, how speed can make the difference in a fishing tournament. Fishing. Most people think of it as a serene pastime, placid and relaxing. But to tournament bass and king mackerel fishermen, speed is a key part of a winning strategy. With hundreds of thousands of dollars of prize money on the line, every second counts. The experts explain. Just the faster the speed, the more time he's got to fish. Uh, if he cuts his running time down to get there faster and he's got more casts to make and that one cast might be the one that wins the tournament. There's been a lot of tournaments that the, the, the last fish that he caught in the last minute was enough to make him win or the large fish was caught in the last four or five minutes when he was fishing. And there again, this gives him the extra speed, the extra three or four casts he wouldn't have had if he had to start back earlier. You take a bass fish when he's 20 miles up the lake and the water's rough, but he's got enough fish in the boat to win the tournament. He can run wide open through everything except the John boat coming back. Uh, these fish run on over two speeds. That's shut off fishing and wide open going. We take off in a tournament one at a time. It's not a shotgun start or anything. But if I'm going to run 120 miles, I want to get there as fast as I can, and I don't want some guy that started, you know, 10, 12 places behind me, possibly three minutes behind me, to pass me and beat me to my fishing place that I'm going to 120 miles away. It's pretty frustrating when you get there and there's somebody sitting on your hole. So if I'm fast enough to know that nobody's going to pass me from behind, and there's a good possibility I can pass several of the guys that started in front of me, you know, I need all the speed I can get. There's many occasions where one mile an hour or two mile an hour over a, you know, a 50 mile run is definitely going to put you out in front of somebody that could possibly be going to the same spot. And years ago, the top speeds on the boats were 45 miles an hour, and now we're reaching speeds of 70 miles an hour. Driving a boat at those type of speeds that we're reaching right now takes a lot of hours, a lot of days on the water of learning how to drive at those type of speeds. It's very important to drive an engine with the trim um, and always look ahead especially the quicker you're running. It's very important because things will happen real fast when you're on the water. But you have to actually work your way through the corners and talk, you know, work the boat a little bit with the trim. Um, you just can't go out and hammer down, expect to run 60 miles an hour plus and have everything work perfect for you. There's no way. The faster speeds that you obtain, the higher out of the water the boat sits, uh, the more angle you have on the engine. And it's very important that you're driving that boat. It's not driving you. Speed is de a definite value to you, and knowing, knowing how to handle the speed and getting top performance out of that boat is, is as important as driving a race car. Coming up next, a hurricane hits the water. On two wheels, Bob Hurricane Hanna was a seven-time national motorcycle racing champion, a master of the secrets of speed on dirt. This past season, he tried his hand at something different, boat racing. And surprisingly, he discovered that flying over the waves in a tunnel boat isn't all that different from flying over the dirt on a motorcycle. It's the same, same deal as uh, feeling the concrete in a car or feeling the dirt on a bike. I, I just come accustomed to feeling the dirt so many years. That's the problem with boat racing is finding that edge and not going over it. The little feedback you get, you've really got to concentrate on. The, the feeling that, feeling the water, you know, I'm always thinking about what the, what's the water doing, what's the boat doing to the water and the air, you know. 
If you go out there and just get into driving mode, in the racing mode, and you forget to trim the boat right all the time, you're actually going to lose time. I mean, you'll get aggressive and you'll want to race and you're, you're losing time. You have to be thinking about trimming the boat all the time and being smooth and hitting the lines. If you're not thinking about it, if you ever get into racing mode and forget that, you can do that in anything. Airplanes, cars, bikes, boats, it's really there, it's all the same. I don't go 10 feet down the straightaway where I'm not thinking about uh, what the wind's doing or what the water's doing. The farther you can look ahead, the better. You don't want to be reading what's 10 feet in front of the boat because you're already you're past that. You've got to be reading 100 yards out there. You know? And that's the same in any race. What makes the difference between a champion and an also ran? A lot of people think they want to go fast, but don't really. I and uh, in motorcycles or airplanes or boats or cars, you got to have a big desire to go fast and big desire to be on the edge all the time. Uh, but, but with some experience, know, know where that edge is. That's the problem with boat racing is finding that edge and not going over it. I was at the end of the straightaway. I was running with my teammate Scott. And uh, we were just really a couple hundred feet from the end of the straightaway. And I wasn't getting the RPM I wanted. And I wanted to bump the engine out just a little bit. And I did. And I overdid it. And it just left the water. We got, things got real quiet. I puckered up pretty good. <laughs> After all is said and done, what is the secret of speed on water? Well, the experts all agree. You must trim the boat up so you can fly the waves. But you must also make sure you fly them low. Or way up in the air, it's usually way out of control. You don't have any propellers pushing you, and so you're much better to skim across the top of the waves rather than becoming airborne. The key to speed on the water is the less friction you have, the faster you're going to go. And so you've got to find the fine line, similar to flying an airplane, that lifts the boat off the water far enough to have maximum speed, but not far enough to where the end wind will get underneath the boat and blow it over backwards. Yeah, that's basically it, is to get the boat out of the water and just barely be running on the back of the boat and fly it almost like an airplane. <laughs>